Uh, good morning to everyone and happy Black History Month. I want to begin this teaching with two disclaimers, one about American history and the other about the Bible. Just a few weeks ago, Netflix published a new stand-up special from Trevor Noah entitled, Where Was I? Near the beginning, he spoke about a recent trip he took to the nation of Germany, which inspired him to think about history in a new way. He said, when you travel through Germany, you cannot escape the past of both Berlin and what Germany did. In Germany, they teach their kids about what they did in school. They're like, hey, this is what Germany did. They make sure their kids know but they don't make their kids feel guilty about it. They'll say to their kids, hey kids, I hope you understand, Germany did this. You're not responsible because you weren't there. However, because you're the future of Germany, it's your responsibility to make sure this does not happen again. This idea resonated in my soul. Today, we are talking about a terrible chapter in American history. And when I look into the beautiful faces in this room, and consider the people who participate in this church online, I see both the present and the future of America. I have no desire to make anyone feel guilty for sins that occurred before their lifetimes. Instead, I want to discuss American history with you because this history shaped how the country we live in exists today, and also because it is our responsibility to ensure the sins in our nation's history never happen again. This is the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer needs to be stated because of our biblical story today, which is from the Gospel of Mark. And this story is quite simply unbelievable. I point this out because infantile religion tells people that the crux of any biblical story is whether or not the reader believes the story literally and historically occurred in the precise manner that the Bible records it. This approach to scripture is remarkably dull. Instead, the approach I find endlessly exciting is when, is when we stop worrying about the historicity of a biblical story and instead ask ourselves how these words challenge us to become more loving people. This church and I personally trust these words from Apostle John who declared that everyone who loves knows God and is born of God. Today's story from Scripture contains unbelievable ideas about demons and exorcisms and pigs, and if you feel like your skepticism rising while you hear this sensational story, then I want to invite you to trust that this story, whether it is true or not, can still help all of us to be more fully human. In short, for all the skeptics in the congregation today, I want you to relax, and I want you to know that I have no desire to convince you that the following story is true. <laughs> Instead... I hope this story sparks a discussion in your life about what it means to become a more loving person. Now, with both of those disclaimers declared, please join me as we travel back 2,000 years in history to the fifth chapter in the Gospel of Mark. Here, Jesus and his disciples board a boat in Capernaum. They sail 10 miles across the Sea of Galilee to the region known as the Decapolis, specifically the country of the Gerasenes, where they disembark from their vessel and stand in knee-deep water. Upon splashdown, an unexpected and hostile stranger rushes toward the waiting travelers at full speed. In the midst of this commotion, Mark, the narrator, cinematically interrupts the scene with a voiceover to inform us of this sprinting stranger's origin story. We are told that this unnamed Gerasene man, who we will call Alex going forward, is possessed by a demon, and this demon has wrought havoc upon every aspect of Alex's life. For some time now, the demon's possession of Alex irritated and annoyed the people of Alex's hometown. They grew wary of his constant disturbance of the peace. They whispered to each other about how unpleasant Alex was. Whenever someone tried to help Alex, they returned exhausted, telling their peers, there is no way to help that man. Parents worried that Alex might harm their children. Businessmen complained Alex scared their customers. Children grumbled about Alex's body odor, while adults changed routes in the village to avoid Alex on their way home. While everyone talked about how much they wanted Alex to become well, no one wanted Alex to live in their neighborhood, which left the townspeople with no other choice. They forced Alex into exile, turning Alex into a pariah. 
Without a home to call his own, Alex made his bed in the nearby cemetery and slept among the tombs of the dead. During the day, Alex gathered sharp rocks and scraped his arms with the rocks until he bled. He cried out in pain, but no one listened to him. They only heard him, and hearing him burdened the townspeople with guilt. They swarmed the authorities of the village and demanded that the authorities do something about Alex and his anguished screams. So the solution the authorities came up with was to shackle Alex to the ground. With his arms restrained, they thought, Alex would no longer uh, be able to scrape his skin, which would subdue his cries of agony, which led to the authorities bringing hammers, stakes, and chains to the graveyard, where they tied Alex down like a dog. But Alex was a strong man with an even stronger heart. He refused to be subdued. And when the authorities left, Alex, with all of his might, pulled on the chains. These chains strained under the power of Alex's muscles until suddenly the chains snapped in two. Free again to roam the cemetery, Alex scavenged for more sharp rocks, and when he found them, he scraped his arms once again, which cry caused them to cry out in pain once again, which irritated the townspeople once again which brought the authorities to the cemetery once again, which chained Alex to the ground once again, which led Alex to break free from the chains once again, which initiated the cycle of futility all over again. Mark does not share how many times this cycle occurred, but as I read the text, I am left with the impression this cycle transpired at least three times. What Mark does share is that eventually the townspeople gave up, and they begrudgingly allowed Alex to drift free in the cemetery, cutting himself with rocks and crying out in pain. With that backstory complete, Mark then directs us back to the initial scene of this chapter where Alex, full of smells, covered in dirt, and screaming incoherently, charges toward Jesus and his disciples on the seashore. But, what Alex, what, but when Alex arrives within striking distance of Jesus, he does not lash out. Rather, Alex falls at the feet of Jesus and yells, What do you want from me, Jesus, firstborn of the Most High God? Swear by God that you will not torture me. In a calm voice, Jesus asks a surprising question in response. What is your name? And in response to this surprising question, Alex offers a surprising answer. My name is Legion, for there are many of us. In other words, Alex's possession where Alex's disease had become so severe that the disease was now speaking louder than his own voice. But we are not done with the surprises. And yet another strange twist, Alex, or more accurately, the demon inside Alex, Legion, begs Jesus not to send him out of the area. Apparently, demons love living on waterfront property. Before Jesus can come up with a solution, Legion looks up the mountainside and sees a plentiful plethora of pink pigs foraging under the sun. If one set aside an afternoon to count the drove, they would arrive at the sum total of 2,000 pigs. Jesus, Legion says, send me and my fellow demons to the pigs so that we can possess them. Without a word, Jesus nods. And Legion and his demonic cronies exhume themselves from Alex's body and flurry rush into the hides of the hogs. Immediately, the pigs squeal and snort and shake with unpredictable gyrations as the pigs become deeply agitated. The pigs move without any kind of foresight. They bump into each other. They headbutt each other. They flail at each other until finally they run at each other, which eventually leads them into a cacophonous stampede toward the edge of a cliff overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Like lemmings, the pigs careen over the edge and fall to their death. Now, I have a confession to make. I'm a city boy. And in all of my life, I have never seen 2,000 pigs together. I point this out because 2,000 pigs is a lot of pigs. <laughs> to give you an idea of how many pigs 2,000 pigs is, we need to calculate how long it would take for all 2,000 pigs to all run off a cliff, right? So if we assume that five pigs can fall off the cliff's edge at one time, and it takes two seconds for between the groups of five to fall off the edge, then it would take 800 seconds for the stampede to end. Which means that the people observing this bizarre event would be watching pigs die for almost 14 minutes. 
for all the kids that are in the congregation today, that's the equivalent of two full episodes of Bluey. <laughs> two episodes. Wall-to-wall -wall pigs falling to their demise. That, my friends, is a lot of pigs. Sometime during this odd scene, the swine herds of the 2,000 pigs have seen enough. They run to the town and tell the townspeople about it. The same townspeople who, may I remind you, chained Alex to the ground. By the time these townspeople arrive back at the scene, they see the Sea of Galilee littered with pig carcasses, a handful of unknown foreigners on the shore, and next to these strangers, in a serene state of mind, is Alex. He is breathing calmly. He is at peace with the world. And he is healed. Consider this story from the perspective of the townspeople. While we are unsure of the time frame, they have been, for some time, completely overwhelmed and discouraged by Alex's condition. They were driven mad by Alex's madness. So mad, they were willing to disparage their own humanity and chain a human being to the ground. Therefore, we assume the townspeople are elated to see Alex in a different and right state of mind. But Mark tells us a very different story. We read, as the townspeople approached Jesus, they caught sight of the one who had been possessed, sitting fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were filled with fear. This miracle of Jesus reveals a tragic undercurrent of the story. For days and months and most likely years, the townspeople spoke to each other about how they would do anything to have the problem of Alex's illness go away. And then they find themselves standing in that very moment, and rather than feeling humility and appreciation as the recipients of a miracle from God, they only feel terror. This fear is so overwhelming, they beg Jesus to leave their town, and Jesus complies. He and his disciples wade back to their boat and climb over the gunwale. As they begin to raise the sail, Alex sloshes out to the boat in a hurry and says, Jesus, please take me with you. I want to be one of your followers. But Jesus shakes his head. No. He says, go home to your people and tell them what God has done for you. Jesus then turns and with his disciples sets sail and leaves Alex, the townspeople, and the country of the Gerasenes behind. Now, growing up, this story has taught, was taught to me in this way. There are demons who are alive and want to attack us right now. But don't worry. Jesus Christ has power over every demon. And as long as you pray and you read your Bible and attend church and don't drink and don't have sex before marriage and type OM gosh instead of OMG, <laughs> then Jesus will ensure you never get possessed by a demon. But if you do fall to any of those temptations then you better hope you meet a Christian who does not fall to those temptations so that that Christian can perform an exorcism on you before it's too late. And while I believe this growing up, I now see how much this cheapens the story. Because this interpretation neglects the most human, the most relatable, and the most believable part of the entire story. When Alex was healed, the townspeople were not happy. Instead, they were filled with what? Fear. fear. They were filled with fear. This story is saturated with wisdom for our modern world. Christians frequently turn a blind eye to this wisdom because this wisdom challenges the way we live today and does not allow us to maintain the status quo. We can dive deeper into the wisdom if we empathize with the ancient culture which produced this story. We need to take a step back morally for a second, though. Back before the time of the organization PETA, and the awareness of ethical animal treatment. Because in this ancient world, when Mark writes this story, these pigs were not thought of as living creatures, but solely as monetary capital. To the swine herds in this story, these pigs were their livelihood. And while I fruitlessly searched for the estimated worth of a pig in first century Palestine, I found information about how much a pig is worth in our economy today. According to Harmony Springs Farm in Maryland, a fully grown pig today is worth $600 to $750 a piece. 
Now, if we take the average of that number and multiply it by 2,000, then we discover that the drove of pigs which Jesus allowed to die was worth a grand total of $1.35 million. This is a lot of money, but it's an extraordinary amount of money for a tiny little village that has left no archaeological trace. This sum total leads me to believe that these 2,000 pigs belong to more people than just the swine herds. The worth of these assets are so high, it's reasonable to assume that this town's primary industry is the industry of pork. And this reasonable assumption completely changes the way we perceive the story, doesn't it? Now, a skeptic might object and say, if this town's primary industry was pork, then why didn't Mark just tell us that? To that objection, I would say, I think he did. Because as I stated earlier, 2,000 pigs is a lot of pigs. And I have a strong hunch that anyone from 2,000 years ago would have heard about 2,000 pigs and thought, well, it takes a village to raise that many pigs. <laughs> so the people of this town are swineherds and butchers and feed suppliers and packers and shippers and traders and farmers and fertilizer gatherers and bankers. Of course, not everyone in the town has a job in which they interact with the pigs, but we can easily imagine that the entire town's economy most likely rises and falls with the industry of pork. With the local economy in mind, I can understand how the townspeople arrived at the scene and saw Alex calmly sitting on the seashore with the corpses of 2,000 pigs bobbing next to him in the Sea of Galilee, and they were immediately filled with fear. For, their, for them, their minds scrambled to figure out what this means for their fragile economy, which has just taken a $1.35 million hit. In their duress, they looked around for someone to blame, and they pointed their fingers at the foreigners as they cried, they did this to us, and then begged them to leave. From the perspective of the townspeople, I can see how Jesus Christ is the villain in this story, which raises the question, why did Jesus Christ, who Christians proclaim to be the Son of God, destroy a village's local economy? I think the answer is because Jesus believed there is more to life than economic prosperity and financial stability. This ancient story about pigs and demons and swine herds challenges all of us living in a capitalist society to journey inward and ask a difficult question. Am I living my life in a way that trusts there is more to life than economic prosperity and financial stability? This can be especially difficult today because we often view economic prosperity and financial stability as deities of their own accord. Upon hearing this question, your ego, probably just like my ego, will tempt you to pull the ejection handle and say, yes, I do, thank God I'm not like the townspeople, and then move on with your life completely unchanged. But if you have a heart, which I know everyone here does, we need to stop and ask, why would Jesus send all of these innocent people into financial ruin? The answer is a rather uncomfortable one. I believe that these people were not innocent. Remember the exile the townspeople forced on Alex because he threatened their business dealings? Remember the bed among the graves they relegated Alex to sleep in because they did not want him disturbing the peace? Remember the chains they placed on Alex because they did not want to listen to his cries for help? And while these townspeople politely told themselves they would do anything, anything at all, if it meant that Alex could one day be cured, the death of these pigs and their fear revealed that they actually would not do anything for the well-being of Alex. All of these pleasantries exchanged among the Gerasenes are exposed as lip service by the dramatic actions of Jesus Christ. And while the townspeople were filled with fear at the massive economic hit to their town's economy, I believe they are also filled with fear because Alex, now in the right state of mind, could turn on them and tell the world how horrendously cruel they all had been to him. Or with Alex being a strong man, they were afraid that he might chain each of them up one by one and treat them the way that they had treated him. 
This story asks us to journey inward and ask the question, am I living in a way that trusts there is more to life than economic prosperity and financial stability? But this story asks us to keep going with another, even more difficult question. When I consider the way I hold on to my money, am I more concerned about growing my money and keeping my money than I am concerned about the well-being of another human being? This is a hard question for us to ask in America today. After all, one of our favorite superheroes is Batman, a billionaire who solves Gotham City's psychological healthcare crises by pummeling the mentally ill into submission and then locking them in an asylum. My friends, I have good news for all of us this morning. Batman is the antithesis of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Jesus has something better to offer us than Batman. The gospel calls us to a life of overflowing compassion, innovative love, and generous inclusion rather than economic prosperity or financial stability. And if entire economies need to be burned to the ground so that human beings can love one another just as we love ourselves, well, this story illustrates that this economic loss and rebuilding is the work of God. Now, if you are listening carefully to my words, you may have noticed the, my intentional use of medical terms to describe the process of Jesus casting legion out of Alex's body. For this story, I employed words such as healing, cure, and well. But on this morning in particular, I want to ask you, was Alex cured or was Alex liberated? This question causes me to prefer the language of demons and possessions, even though I do not personally believe literal demons exist. Because if Legion is opposing, oppressing Alex and Jesus breaks the hold Legion has over Alex, then isn't that the act of liberation? And when we consider that the Bible starts with a massive liberation of one million slaves, then every liberation in the whole of human history must be considered the work of God. But the story does not stop with questions even at this point, because the more I think about this, the more I am convinced that the demon named Legion is real. Not real in the way that a demon has a heartbeat or the demon is a self-conscious entity, but real in the way that this demon is the embodiment of the townspeople's greed. And if the liberator Jesus Christ arrives in a village by the sea, then I hold a strong suspicion that he is not interested in liberating just one man, but has a desire to liberate every human being in the town because that's the business that God is in. My friends, I firmly believe that any time anyone chooses love over greed, they are participating in the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter what they believe. The internet taught us that anyone can believe anything they want without proof. But a life of great faith is a life that strives to be less greedy and more compassionate. For all of my Christian siblings who are listening this morning, I hope that when you share your testimony about what Jesus has done for you, a big part of that testimony will be about how Jesus liberated you from the demon of greed. I speak pointedly about greed because greed is inextricably linked to the United States of America and our history. And until just a few years ago, I was completely unaware of the scale of this greed in our history. The great ta Coates, brought my, my attention to the enormity of this greed when he wrote an article in The Atlantic entitled Slavery Made in America. In this article, he cites three different history scholars which paint a very different picture of the Civil War than what I was taught in school. He cites Dr. Roger Ransom, who records that, the South Carol, uh, that in South Carolina, when the war began, almost 60% of the people living in the state were enslaved. He talked about Dr. James McPherson's work, which argued that not only was the Civil War first and foremost about the institution of racially motivated chattel slavery, but also about how the war was about economic expansion and how there was this different philosophy as to how they were going to economically expand into the West. But the idea that rocked my paradigm was from Yale professor Dr. David Blight that Coates shared. Dr. Blight teaches that by 1860, there were more millionaires, slaveholders all, living in the lower Mississippi Valley than anywhere else in the United States. The greatest concentration of wealth was in the lower Mississippi Valley. He then goes on to say, in the same year, 
the, the nearly 4 million American slaves were worth some $3.5 billion, making them the largest single financial asset in the entire U.S. economy, worth more than all manufacturing and railroads combined. In Mark 5, we have a story about Jesus destroying a thriving economy that oppresses another human being. How is it then that the United States of America, which during its founding professed to be a nation of Christians, built an economy on the oppression of human beings, even though Jesus Christ dismantles that specific type of economy in Mark 5? The reason is because white Christians in America loved money more than they loved people. They were possessed by the demon of greed. On a national level, we have this idea that a party or a president is successful if the economy is strong while the party or president is in power. During this election year, I have no interest in telling you how to vote. However, I feel a strong urge to remind all of us that Christians must remember Mark 5. We need to remind each other that there are things far more important in our country than economic prosperity or financial stability. Christians should not be voting based primarily on what is good for our wallets. Instead, we should be voting based primarily on what is good for one another. If it works for us, then it needs to work for Alex. This is what we must remember during this year on a national level. On a personal level, money is not inherently sinful. But money reveals to all of us where our priorities lie, doesn't it? And so this story asks each of us a personal and practical question. Are you living your life in a way which tangibly demonstrates you care more about the well-being of another than growing your financial wealth? And if this question leads you to an answer out of uncertainty, then I would encourage you to think about what a personal life that prioritizes the well-being of another looks like on a practical level. Write those ideas down and then chase after that life with reckless abandon. This explosive story of Jesus invites all of us to rise above the temptation of greed and embrace compassion. But this is not the only invitation in the story. Remember how Alex asked Jesus to become one of his disciples and Jesus shook his head? Instead, Jesus asked him to go back to his hometown and proclaim the good news of his liberation to the very people who oppressed him. Now, I assume Alex was crushed to have his request rejected by Jesus, but Mark does not offer any commentary on Alex's feelings. Instead, Mark records Alex doing exactly what Jesus asked him to. He returned to the town that oppressed him and shared his story. When everyone in the town had heard his story, Alex then went on to the other nine local villages of the Decapolis, proclaiming the good news of his own liberation. Two chapters later, the story continues in the seventh chapter of Mark. Jesus and his di disciples are sailing on the Sea of Galilee once again to the country of the Gerasenes, and specifically the region of the Decapolis. Now, they have been gone for two chapters, and we have been following their story in the Gospel of Mark. Meanwhile, Alex has been doing something in the Decapolis. Within moments of their arrival in the Decapolis, Word spread instantly of Jesus' return, and a massive crowd of approximately 10,000 people assembled to listen to Jesus teach in the wilderness. 10,000 people in the Decapolis, a non-Jewish collection of cities without any family members or of Jesus or the disciples or any kind of social networking or even YouTube. The only way this crowd showed up in this specific area is because the word of mouth from Alex who is just one liberated man. Even though he is a minor character in Scripture, Christians must learn to celebrate Alex's story because celebrating Alex's story can ground us in the hope of what is possible when we trust the gospel truth that economics and pensions and wealth accumulation should never come at the expense of the well-being of another human being. In the same way, Mentors have taught me Black History Month is first and foremost a celebration of black excellence in America. These stories of specifically black excellence ground all of us in the hope of what is possible when we prioritize the well-being of everyone and not just the well-being of some. For that reason, I want to close with a story of black excellence specifically tied to the ideas shared in the story from Mark 5. 
1831, Rebecca Davis was born in the state of Delaware. Shortly thereafter, Rebecca Davis moved in with her aunt in Pennsylvania, and she observed firsthand how her aunt provided compassionate health care for the citizens of her hometown. Rebecca Davis would later write that because of her aunt, she, quote, early conceived a liking for and sought every opportunity to be in a position to relieve the sufferings of others. In 1852, at the age of 21, Rebecca Davis helped relieve suffering as a nurse. She impressed the male doctors she worked for, and they wrote letters on her behalf to the New England Female Medical College. In 1860, she was accepted into medical school, and four years later, graduated with a degree of Doctress of Medicine, becoming the first African-American woman physician in the country's history. Shortly after she graduated, the Civil War ended. She wrote, my mind centered upon Richmond, the capital city of Virginia, as the proper field for real missionary work. And she became a doctor for the Freedmen's Bureau, a federal agency dedicated to the well-being of newly liberated human beings. While there, she met her husband, a recently liberated man, and became Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler. After a decade in the mission field, she returned to her educational home of Boston in 1866, and here, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler opened the doors of her personal home and welcomed any and all ill children into her living room. She provided health care for every child, regardless of whether or not they had the ability to pay. Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler embodied the gospel of Jesus Christ by caring for these children first before worrying about money. She was not only a trailblazer, but she was also a generous soul. My friends, may her story inspire you to become more generous in today's world. May the story of pigs and exorcisms and demons challenge you to look inward and ask how you can prioritize another's well-being over your own financial gain. And may you participate in the gospel of Jesus Christ by, becoming, by rising above greed and embracing compassion. Amen.